Good morning. As we get into our text this morning, Hebrews chapter 5, uh, let me just remind you all that uh, starting next week on the 24th, um, I'm going to be teaching a class called Learning the Basics, Gospel 101. Um, we're going to talk about it a little bit actually during the sermon time. Um, it's basically called Learning the Basics. It would talk about some of the basic truths of Christianity. What, what is the Word of God? Where did the Word of God come from? What is the nature of God? We'll look at the different aspects of God's nature. Who is Christ? What is the atonement? Some of the foundational uh, truths of the gospel. So sign up if you'd like at the information table and um, plan on grabbing a lunch and meeting for about an hour and a half on the next four weeks on Sunday morning. Or it will be afternoon by then um, after our corporate worship. Gospel 101, Learning the Basics. So with that, turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 5. We are going to be looking at Hebrews 5 verse 11 through Hebrews 6 verse 3. Remember, chapters and verses are not in the original writings. Uh, we'll put there years later so that you wouldn't be going through one book without any trying to find out where I'm at. Like, what did you say? I can't find it. So chapter 5 verse 11 through chapter 6 verse 3. The book of Hebrew Bibles in the back, reading from the ESV, English Standard Version. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11, through chapter 6, verse 3. Hear now the word of God. About this we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good and evil. Chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God, and of instruction about washings, the laying on hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word this morning. So let me bring everybody up to speed again. This letter, this exhortation was written to a Jewish community. A Jewish community of Christ followers that were under severe persecution. And the purpose of this letter, this purpose of this encouragement was to encourage them not to go back to the rituals, to the ceremonies, to the practices of the Old Testament. Not that any of them were wrong. They were good. They were given to us by God. But now because of the coming of Christ, they have been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God. And therefore, the author has been courageously instructing them to trust in the supremacy, the superiority, and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ the Lord. Again, he opened his letter with seven affirmations describing the nature of God, the nature of Jesus who is God. Seven Old Testament references substantiate his claims in chapter 1. And then over and over, the supremacy, the superiority, and sufficiency of Christ has been laid out. And, he, and the author has been saying that he is better, he is greater. That's where we get our title for the sermon series, he is greater, he's better than the angels in chapter 1 and 2. He is greater and better, more superior to Moses, chapter 3, chapter 4, he's greater and better to Joshua. And by the end of chapter 4, we get into a, a, a new understanding of who Christ is better than, and that is he is superior to the Old Testament high priest, or the priest, and in generally a priest, but also Aaron, who is the first high priest. Jesus is the great high priest. Coupled with this superiority of Christ, he's given us warnings. We've gotten two clear warnings so far. We're going to see one more next week, and there'll be five. There's five altogether in this book. And these warnings are to teach us, not that genuine believers can lose their salvation, because they've been redeemed and reconciled and, and, and saved by God's grace alone, but that these warnings are given to us for a self-reflection. They, they are to be taken seriously. Again, not because we can lose what we have not gained, what God has given us by grace alone, but there are warnings that God uses to help us persevere in the faith. It's one of the ways he encourages believers to press on. One of the ways he confronts unbelievers to deal with what's going on in their life. 
Last week, we moved from the warnings into a word of encouragement. Again, that Jesus is the greater and the better high priest. Jesus' high priest was after, we said last week, after the order of Melchizedek. Not the priestly tribe of Levi that's been set out in the Old Testament, but that he is better than Melchizedek under the order of Melchizedek. We'll look at that when we get to chapter 7. And we're told in chapter 4, verse 16, that because Jesus is our better and greater high priest, we can, chapter 4, verse 16, can confidently draw near to the throne of grace, entering into the presence of God, to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And if we could summarize this idea of Jesus being the better and the greater, the more superior and sufficient high priest, I think we would say something like this. Jesus is the supreme, superior, and all-sufficient high priest because he did not enter a man-made temple, but entered heaven itself before the presence of God. He is that the high priest, a better high priest, because he is fully human. He, he is able to sympathize with our weaknesses He's, and our temptations, yet without sin. He's been called and appointed by God himself as the eternal son, eternal king, eternal priest, to act on behalf of men who offered up himself as the perfect sacrifice, who cried out and prayed out to God and was heard not because of someone else, but because he himself has earned the right as the perfect spotless son of God to enter into the presence of God. And chapter 5, verse 19, he's the only source of our salvation. And although we will return to the person and work of Jesus as our high priest as we move to chapter 7, but for now the author just stops dead in his tracks because he realizes there's a problem. There's a, there's a teaching problem in the church. Chapter 5, verse 11. About this, we have much to say. And it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. You hear what he's saying? He's saying the priesthood of Jesus Christ under the order of Melchizedek is hard to explain because they become dull. The issue is his reader's immaturity and lack of spiritual commitment. And he stops dead in his tracks before moving on to this very important topic, which he will pick up again and says, y'all need to hear something. <laughs> the more I get into this letter, it's like, your bunch of babies grow up. We love you. Jesus is your high priest. You know, it's like, it's like schizo. You know, it's like, I want to encourage you. It's great. You're all a bunch of idiots. Stop getting your heart, 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 your heart so hard. You know, it's like, which one is it? Well, he's going back and forth. And now he wants to uh, say something to them before he moves on. So there's a lack of maturity. So we're going to look at immature milk drinkers, <laughs> mature meat eaters, and then to keep with the theme, good eating habits. I, that's all I can come up with. I'll explain when I get there. I mean, what am I going to say? All right. Verse 11 again. About this, we have much to say. It's hard to explain since you become dull of hearing. By this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. Again, about this, referring to the, the greater high priest, Jesus Christ, over Aaron and other priests of the Old Testament. And rather than move forward, he interrupts the discussion, puts it on hold, and wants to exhort the church, actually reprove to some degree this church for their spiritual dullness, dullness and immaturity in the faith. The point he's making is unless, unless we deal with this reality, unless we deal with what's going on here in your, the congregation, why go any further? Let's not press on. The word dull of hearing comes from a Greek word, nothros. It, it's two words, made up of two words, no and push. Literally means no push, slow, sluggish, lethargic, intellectually numb, or as I thought of myself, thick-headed, spiritually dull, right? And the author says, like, the priesthood of Christ is difficult to explain. See what he says there? It, it, this, is, this is hard to explain. Notice he doesn't say it's hard to understand or, or it's, hard, it's too confusing. It is difficult to explain, he says, because the people have become lazy to understand. 
They don't have the mature ears and mind and, and hearts for grasping the concept of the Melchizedek priesthood of Jesus Christ. And the problem, unfortunately, is an acquired condition. This inability to deal with spiritual truth is something that was deficient in them. It wasn't that they were intellectually deficient. They were spiritually lazy. If you see in the, in the verse, it says the word have become. If you see in chapter, uh, six verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 11, you have become dull. That word have become is in the Greek perfect tense, which, which speaks of a process completed in the past having present results. In other words, their inability to apprehend truth was not an inherent natural weakness, but a culpable inability because of the, the hardening of their hearts. And this perfect tense tells us that the process has worked its way out from the past, and now it has come to completion. Their neglect had done its work. And that's what he's been saying all along, if you've been tracking with us, about this, this hardening of your hearts. He keeps saying, do not harden your heart. Do not harden your hearts. And the result, is that un, uh, the, this unattentiveness of, of a slug, of becoming unreceptive and bored, really just uninterested, if I could put it this way, uninterested in the deeper things of God. This, this congregation has become uninterested in the deeper things of God, and therefore they are unable, look what it says, to teach others the things of God. By this time, you ought to be teachers. This doesn't mean that this time there's some, there should be some seminary professors among you, or, or you should be some more pastor and elders, teachers in the church, or, or some of you should be community group leaders by now, although that would probably be the outcome if they were not dull in hearing. But what the author is saying is by now you should know the basics of Christianity and know what you believe and able to teach it, able to share it, able to declare it to other people. I, I guess the, the question we should ask, or you should ask yourself, I need to ask myself, are, are we teaching others the truth of the basics of the gospel? We're not talking about demonstrating the gospel. People get that mixed up. We, we need to do that. We need to love people. We need to care for people. We need to show mercy and grace to people. We need to demonstrate with good deeds. But it's the declaration of the gospel, the teaching of the New Testament. It is what, what is the gospel? Are you able to do that? If not, why not? If you've been walking with Christ for any amount of time, are you able to do that? And we'll come back to that in a minute. But notice what the author says. By this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone now, though, to teach you again the basic principles of the oracle of God. You need milk, not solid food. You need milk, not solid food. Now, unless, unless you're, you're brand new in the faith, you, you're expected to be teachers, training new believers in the fundamentals of the faith. The gospel needs to be taught. You heard this before, right? Preach the gospel, if necessary, use words. It's stupid. There's an argument about who said it. I don't know who said it. The gospel needs words. It's impossible to share the gospel without words. There needs to be maturing disciples who are training up newer, younger experience, right? Less developed disciples in the church. Notice what he says. He says, again. You see what he says? To, to teach you again. In other words, he's saying, look, we covered this already, man. We, we did this already. Why are we going over the basic principles over and over of the oracle of God's, the, the basic principles of God's word, his revelation? Why are we doing this again? And, and I think, again, I think the author, I, I think there's something different, and we talk about this all the time here. There's something different about renewing or rehearsing or reviewing the basics of the gospel. We need to constantly do that. He's not saying, re you know, don't review, don't rehearse. He's saying, why are we relearning the basics? Okay? The implication is that the church has forgotten, hasn't really learned yet, what they should know by heart, the truth of the basics of Christianity, of being a Christ follower. And this is important on two levels, if I can get practical. So if, if you're here, and don't raise your hand, and, and you're one of the lazy ones who can't move on, you will not be able to move on until you really learn the basics. 
You can't go on until you learn the basics. But number two, if you're brand new in the faith, you will not be able to grasp. You will never, you'll never be able to grasp the deeper things of God until you do understand the basics. Okay? I remember early on in my, in my walk with Christ, just a couple of years into it, I, I remember the text here. It was in Matthew 28, and this man was preaching on the um, Matthew 28 passage, familiar commission, Great Commission passage. And I remember just watching him preach and listening to him preach and thinking to myself, how did he do that? Like, how did that come out of that verse, those two verses, those three verses, and thinking, I, I, I could never grab all that. I do not. How did he get that? How, he was a mature believer, was preaching the gospel, and I thought to myself, I could never grasp that. I could never teach that. Well, why not? Because I was a baby in Christ. I was still drinking milk. Some of you are here and brand new in the faith, and you're just getting started. You're just learning maybe the things about Jesus. You should rightfully drink milk. You should be drinking milk. I don't care if you're 10 years old or 70 year old, 70 years old. Everyone, and I mean everyone who's new in the faith, needs to be drinking milk. The basics of the Christianity, of grace of life as a Christian Christ follower. Milk is absolutely necessary for healthy growth, right? Every infant needs milk. But the author goes on to say that if you go into Delmonico Steakhouse... <laughs> And there's a, a group of grown men wearing bibs, drinking a bottle. Something's wrong. <laughs> right? It'd be like something out of Twilight Zone. Like, what the? I mean, think of the absurdity of full-grown men and women in diapers who are neither capable of nor desire solid food who sit around, you know, drinking milk and sucking their thumb. There's a problem. That's what he's saying. And it's not the matter of God withholding information. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a matter of God withholding or hiding it's a moral issue, not an intellectual one. It's hard to explain because you're all dull. When, when, when a 35-year-old man is living in the basements of his mom's house, playing video games all day long, it's a problem. Okay? Now, some of you, before you get upset with me, okay, I know there are, there are times, there are particular situations where grown men and women have to move back and get some help. I, I'm with you. Physical difficulties, dis dis disabilities, maybe recovering from an addiction, maybe during a season of divorce and separation, you need some help. I get it. That's not what he's saying here. Th there's a difference between a student who wants to learn, just not grasping the concepts, than someone who's just lazy and doesn't want to learn and wants to put no effort into it, right? We've all been there, Okay. There's nothing wrong with giving milk to an infant, but to put a steak dinner before a six-month-old baby is futile, right? Everything is wrong with offering mother's milk when a child, though, is ready to for steak. Comes a point. It's time to grow up. That's why this word pitcher is so powerful. This congregation ought to be eating steak by now, but they're drinking milk. They're living on milk instead. Now, the Apostle Paul does, and, and the more I read Hebrews, I'm convinced Paul did not write this letter. Uh, but anyway, that was free. Um, Paul does use a metaphor like this, though, in 1 Corinthians 3. This is what he says. I, brothers, could not address you, Paul writing to Corinth, Corinthian church. I, Paul, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not ready, yet ready. For you are still of the flesh. In other words, they're still acting like children, doing whatever their own desires are. They haven't learned yet as adults to crucify their, their sinful desires, their fleshly desires, to live independently of God, and then to live and lean on and rely upon the Holy Spirit's power. They haven't gotten it yet. And just as Paul contrasts in Corinthians, spirit and the flesh, here Hebrews, the author of Hebrew contrasts those who are skilled, and unskilled, if you see that, in the word about righteousness. See what it says? So spiritual immaturity leads to moral immaturity. To, to willingly remain as an infant in Christ makes you a person of the flesh. Okay? Unfit for righteousness. Verse 13. For everyone who lives on milk is what? Unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. That word child is an interesting Greek word, nepios. 
It means immature. It's in contrast to the mature, as he says in verse 14. So family, listen. There's a huge difference between childlike faith and childish faith. Childlike faith, which Jesus commends, is a humble dependency upon God like a child. Coming to Jesus dependent and humble and recognizing his authority over you. Childlike faith. Childish faith is drinking from a bottle. When, when you ought to be taking responsibility like an adult. An adult who is skilled in the principles and precepts of the word of God will distinguish between right and wrong as we will see in a minute. But you have to know the word of God. Now, over the past several years, if you've been looking um, at, at the statistics, Barna puts out statistics. I don't know if you know anything about it, but Barna, a very well-known established research uh, group, has put out statistics, statistics about um, one in particular is Bible literacy in 100 cities. In 100 cities in America, in 2016 and 2017, 100 cities, Albany, right here, <laughs> right here in our good old capital district, one of the lowest cities when it comes to Bible literacy, okay, out of 100, one being the most knowledgeable and 100 being the least knowledgeable of the Bible. Guess where Albany was? And if you know from the statistic, don't say it. Just if you don't know. Uh, Ricky says, all right. <laughs> We're 100 out of 100, okay? We're going to try to change that here at King Chapel. But right now, we are the least Bible-minded city in America, we want to be skilled in the word of righteousness or the message of righteousness, verse 13. If you have an NIV, it's interesting. It says teaching about righteousness, if you have an NIV. Although there's a moral element to this, this message, this word of righteousness, in verse 13, discerning good and evil, as we'll see in chapter 14, uh, verse 14. But I think the word of righteousness, if you look at that for a moment, the end of chapter 13, I think there's a moral aspect to in knowing what's good and evil in verse 14. But I think that there's an also uh, an understanding, what the author wants us to understand, is that we are to understand the word of righteousness, the mess of righteousness, about Christ's righteousness, about the gospel, about where our righteousness comes from, the, the saving work of God. And child, childish, childishness, unskilled in the gospel, Lack of ability to turn to the scripture and to see the work of salvation culminating in this priestly work of Jesus. That's what the author is saying. And therefore they cannot move on to better things than milk. We are not to be ignorant of the gospel. We are to be skilled in the message about the righteousness of Christ. Knowing what's right and wrong as well and walk in the ways in which we've been taught. So I think the letter, I think this letter written to this, this congregation so long ago is a call for us as well to evaluate our own life and, and, and to see whether or not we are committed to the deeper things of God. So let me ask you, what areas of your life in which you are spiritually immature, in which ways that you are acting as an infant when you should take responsibility? Let me ask you also, uh, do you know, are you able to teach and explain the basics of the faith? If not, you should come to that class, putting a plug in. Now, we, me, other pastor elders, community group leaders, to some degree, are responsible to teach the word of God, to teach the basics of Christianity to you. But there's a responsibility you hold as well in learning and growing and maturing in the faith. You're responsible as well. Uh, what excuses do you use? Do you have to make in time? Here's a good question for you all in the community groups as you meet. What does it look like to have a childlike faith, be mature in the faith at the same time? I want to be childlike, but I want to be mature. What does that look like? You could talk about it in your community groups. But we need to move past spiritual milk and move to eating, eat, uh, eating meat, okay? Mature meaty. Look at verse 14. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. What does solid food require? Hard work of chewing, digestion, 
And unless we are diligently and faithfully studying the scriptures and learning of the greater and weightier things of God, we can't possibly train ourselves. We can't possibly exercise our spiritual power, our spiritual strength of discernment. Because only the mature can do it. That's what he's saying. Only the mature can distinguish from good and evil. The mature take responsibility for their growth. They develop appetites to, to learn more about the grace of God, to learn more about the knowledge of God, to understand the deeper things of God. It's even more true for teachers in the church, but I think it's true for all of us. And one of the ways that we can grow in our knowledge, think about this for a minute. One of the ways we grow in knowledge of God is by teaching others. That's what the author is saying, by, by, by teaching others. So, so think about this with me. I thought about this this week, and I'm not pointing any fingers. Just, just between you and the Lord. Maybe, just maybe, we are stunted in our growth or we remain immature because we're not in any kind of real discipleship, mentorship with other people. Maybe. All of us at some level have taught something to something to others. Be it sports, things at work, teaching somebody at the job, maybe at school. We all teach things to other people. And what helps us as we teach others, right? What happens when we teach others, I should say? We cement the truths and experiences in our own life. The things that we teach become more real to us. And when we're faced with things, if you're teaching somebody something and you don't have the answer and you have to come back to that person because you've got to meet with them again to teach them wrestling or whatever it is, you go find out. The more, we mo the, the more we know, the more we should keep on learning. And we are called to teach those things to the people that God brings into our lives. And we remain sharp and we remain, remain growing when we use what we learn. Why does it matter? Why does it matter if we mature in the faith? Why does it matter whether or not we become mature in the faith that we leave milk and, and eat meat? Well, one of the reasons is, and we're going to get into it especially next week, immature believers are much easier to be led astray from the basics of Christianity, from the truth. And that's what the writer has been concerned about throughout this epistle. You can be led away unless you're digesting and you've drank the milk and you're growing in the basics and then adding to that, growing and eating good food. In Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul expresses a similar concern. He said that the church, that God has blessed the church and given the gifts to the church called pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body until we all attain all, that's everybody, the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Then he says, so that teachers equipping the saints, growing up, Measure of fullness in Christ so that we may no longer be children. That's that word again. Nepios, it's, it's, it's immature. So that we may no longer be immature children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Those who do not progress in the truth of the faith are tossed back are tossed to and fro, particularly when faced with deception and lies of the enemy who wants to twist Scripture. And you know what? We live in a, in a wonderful, wonderful age of awesome resources, right? I, I want to be careful here, but I want to be clear, okay? The Scriptures, the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God is the final and authoritative source of our truth, of our faith, of our practice. But we have some really great theologians out there. We have great Bible teachers and scholars who wrote wonderful books that explain the truth of God in ways that you and I are unable to do. There was a man who came into this church years ago, and we started coming a couple times, and I, start, I engaged with him with some conversation, and it seemed he knew the scripture. We started talking about spiritual things, and when I mentioned not only studying the Bible, I mentioned some of the authors that I like to read, he immediately said, oh, I got my Bible. That's all I need is my Bible. I said, oh, okay. Meanwhile, he thinks, all, he thinks he's a, a mature giant. And I'm thinking, all right, so what you're saying is 
I have my Bible. I'm the smartest man that ever walked the planet of the earth. I know everything, so I don't need to read anyone. That's what I was hearing. And I thought, oh, boy. Well, he stayed. We became friends. He began to know how important it is to know the scriptures, to read the scriptures, but also to begin to read what others have to say over the centuries. He became a pastor elder in the church. He's left. He moved out of state now. And he's grown tremendously. Are we eating meat? Continuing, continuing to act like infants, we're, we're, we're rendered unable to understand what is genuine, what is not genuine, right? Counterfeits of the faith and genuine faith. Sound doctrine and dangerous doctrine. The, the spirit of God, what the spirit of God is saying and what the spirit of this age is saying. When we learn the basics, we could build on that. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Let me, let me give you one more story. Every once in a while, I love to put on TBN. They got some crazy people on TBN. <laughs> they got some cool people. I'm okay with that. But they got some crazy people on TBN. And I like, I like to put it on just to watch. My wife thinks I'm crazy. But every time she walks in the room, like, why are you watching? I'm like, this guy's hysterical, you know. The other day I was watching this. I, I call him a Bible teacher. I, I don't know if he would be called, considered Bible city. But anyway, it's an insane show. That I like to watch because he's just out of there. I won't give his name. Sid Roth. Absolutely. <laughs> that dude, no matter what experience you have, you can call and say, an elephant fell from the sky. The Lord showed me that he was falling. And he just believes everything anyone says. Every dream, every burp, everything anyone says, that guy thinks, wow, God is working. I'm like, does he have any discernment at all? I'm watching him the other day, not his book, he's promoting a book. <laughs> For a small donation, you can learn how you can bring down, now listen to this, you can bring down, this book will teach you how you can bring down the Shekinah glory into your life. And I will teach you, for a small donation, if you read this book, I will teach you how you can have access into the very presence of God. Let me save you the money. Okay? The Shekinah glory has come down. His name is Jesus. And he is the only one that could usher you into the presence of God. It, it even, it, one thing you'll never hear Ricky say is, the band's going to play and the band's going to now bring you into the presence of God. The band doesn't bring you into the presence of God. Jesus does. Okay? So I'm thinking, now if you were a Christian for 15 minutes, that might sound great. But if you read the New Testament just once, hopefully you'd be like, that don't sound right. Right? you got to be careful. Okay? you got to be careful. We either are moving forward, we are the moving forward and growing or we're falling back. Status quo Christianity is a mirage. Eating solid food will help you discern good and evil, truth and error. Now, 1 Timothy 4, 7 says this. I want to get into this a little bit. 1 Timothy 4, 7. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. The word train, gymnazo, is where we get the word gymnasium. It is the same Greek word in um, 1 Timothy 4, 7. Gymnazo is the same Greek word in Hebrews chapter four, 5, verse 14, where he talks about being trained by constant practice. Okay, it's this athlete, this imagery of this athlete training, working hard, training himself, getting to the peak condition for the contests. The, the mature Christian is equipped at this point as he's training to, to face responsibly the demands and endure to the end the rigors of conflict and hard times by habitual s s exercise. Growing. They're mature because they have been disciplined they have disciplined themselves by constant use, training on solid food. Do you understand that? Philippians chapter 1 says this, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to work for his good pleasure. We're talking about growing in the faith through hard work. Let me say it again. We're talking about growing in the faith 
through hard work. We're not talking about working real hard to get into the faith. Right? The work has been done. His name is Jesus. So we want to be a church that's heavy on grace and recognize that we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, without no work of your own. Nothing you can do. But we also want to be balanced in Scripture and talk about the, the disciplines of the faith. Coming into community, reading the word, doing the things that we do. Again, religion says, I obey God. I do everything God has told me to do. Read the Bible, go to church, uh, get in community group, um, uh, uh, gather together with the saints. All the things that God does, if I obey him in that, then he'll love me and he'll care for me and he'll accept me. That's religion. The gospel is he will love and accept me because of all that Christ has done, his perfect sacrifice, and it's by grace alone, through faith alone, I'm accepted by God because of what Jesus has done, and therefore I will obey him and do the church disciplines of reading Scripture and going to church, not in order to get God to, to love me, but because he already does. But let's not lose the reality of the gospel presses us and grows us and, and teaches us to, to work out our salvation. That's by grace alone, through faith alone. It, it, it's not, it's not this, 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 you know, it's not an effort that's, that's not active. It's active. It, it's work to get up and read the scriptures every day. Again, not to get God to love me because he already loves me. We'll get, we're going to end with that. So what are you doing? Let me ask you a question. Again, don't raise your hand. You guys talk about it in community group. What are you doing? Are you making efforts to progress in your walk with God? Are, are you regularly confessing and repenting of sin? Where and what are your priorities? We, listen, if you want to grow in your job, you're going to put the effort in. If you're going to want to grow in your schooling and academia, you're going to put the effort in. Whatever you do that you want to do better, you're going to put the effort in. All right, this is straightforward. If we're not moving forward, we're moving backwards. Are you praying? Are you making commitments to be in community group? The, the fertile soil of optimal spiritual growth. Are, are, you, are you in a community group? Are you intentional about growing together? Are you spending time with God and his word? Are you preparing for community group? We've been giving out those cards, the Fasium Day cards with questions. Are you in the scripture, reading the scripture? Again, hear me carefully. It is not so that God will love you. It's because God already loves you. Okay? So that's, that's, I think that's the, that's the encouragement we're hearing this morning. And we're, we should take it seriously. So a mature Christian, eating meat Christian, is someone who is practically and experientially putting the truth of God's word into their lives, not just for information, but transformation. They're committed to Christ. They're being strengthened in Christ. They're learning the deeper things of God, and they're realizing as they're learning, and we're going to talk about this at the class, another plug, if we're learning the things about God, it's not just for intellectual knowledge. When we learn about the sovereignty of God, we learn about creation, sovereignty, purposes, providence, that should deepen our faith and transform our lives. If we understand what sovereignty means, we should rest in what's going on in our lives and have faith in God, grow in our faith in God when difficulties come. You see, the, see, it's not just intellectual, it's, it's spiritual, it's growing in holiness and sanctification, growing in the image of Christ, learning to love him, learning to, to lean on him each and every day. And the goal is gradually move from a diet of milk to solid food. And we'll see next week, it'll keep you from falling away into apostasy. We'll talk about that next week. So finally, good eating habits. Therefore, chapter 6, verse 1. Let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith and of faith toward God. And of instructions about washings, the laying on hands, the resurrection of the dead, the, and eternal judgment. There are elementary things that we learn. That's what he's saying. There are elementary things that we learn, that, that we, when we're new in the faith. He just mentions them. Things that we are not to forget. But the elementary things are foundations to build on. Okay, got that? The, what, what he's saying is, Leave the elementary doctrine, not leave it in a sense of forgetting about it, but recognizing that we're not to stay and camp on those elementary principles of truth. 
We're to build on them, not to abandon them. We are to build on them, all right? And the writer gives us six foundational truths, right? And it looks, if you look at the list, there's, there's, a, there's six things, and they're in pairs of two. I went to public school, so that makes three of them. Three pairs of two equals six, okay? <laughs> in order to eat well, we must drink milk and then press on to real food, and look what he says first. The very first thing he talks about, what is taught at the beginning of all of our lives as a Christ follower, repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Jesus comes on the scene, Mark chapter 1. The Bible tells us in chapter 1 of Mark, uh, verse 14, he came on the scene. What was the first thing he said? He's proclaiming the gospel. And he says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. This elementary doctrine of Christ, this foundational truth is particularly important because the Jewish people that he's writing to were being tempted to go back to ritualism as a means of salvation, as a means of hope in the midst of this persecution that was going on. To repent is to change one's mind, metanoia, change of mind. It's a change of attitude. It's a turnaround of one's position, one's direction. It's a demonstration when we abandon our self-adequacy, our self-salvations, and we turn to God from our self-adequacy, our self-salvation, and we turn to God in sorrow for sinfully robbing him of the glory that is due him. The movement from trusting yourself into union with Christ begins with this awareness of sin, this lawlessness, this rebellion against God, a rebellion against God and a sincere conviction that my sin is in violation and a rebellion of, cre of our creator. And then genuinely turning from that, which here in our text says, genuine repentance turning from what? Your works that lead to death. Sinful deeds, motives, attitudes that stand under God's condemnation. You turn from that to trusting in the work of Christ for forgiveness and salvation. It's interesting, the Apostle Paul writes this to the church of, of Thessalonica. And he says, you know what, I, I was at Macedonia. And, and I was listening to the report there of Macedonia, in Macedonia. And what they were saying about you, Thessalonica. And, and I want to encourage you what they've been saying about you. What Macedonians were saying about the church in Thessalonica. And this is what he said to them. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you, church, turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. See, there's a turning to and a turning from. Okay? You've got to turn from walking as your own Savior and you're sinning against God, rebelling against God, and there's a turning to Christ as my Savior and now wanting to want to follow and, and, and Him be king of my life. That's what repentance means. True biblical repentance must have the element of not only turning, but trusting in Christ. You could say, I should stop doing this, and even stop doing it. But if it's not a turning in faith to God, it's not true biblical, repent, uh, bi true biblical repentance. Philip Hughes in his commentary writes this, I thought it was good. He said, alienation from God, due to our sin, who is the source of all life, whether through... The idol worship and immorality of heathendom, Gentiles, non-Jews, or through the self-centered religiosity and works righteousness of Judaism can result only in death. So whether you're living in rebellion and don't want to hear anything what God has to say, or you're trying to work your way into salvation, all those works are dead. Get you nowhere. And he's concerned that these... People who are turning to Judaism, turning to rituals, or whatever you may be turning to. The emphasis on these works, either it's rebellion or even, even obedience. If it's for the purpose of being right before God, it's dead. Jesus Christ, the great and better high priest, establishes our righteousness through his perfect life. Through his atoning death. So question for you. If, you've been, if, you, if you're brand new or you're new in the faith, or this is not for you, but if you've been a Christian for quite some time, can you explain, just at least in some detail, what it means 
to be justified, that's a very important biblical word. I'm not going to put you on the spot, as I put my, one of my best friends on the spot this week. He was <laughs> over the house doing some painting, and he's been a Christian since I, uh, right, right, right after me a couple of years, 30 years, maybe 20 years. Hey, Daryl, he's not listening now, I hope. <laughs> Explain to me, what does justification mean? He was pretty good. I'll give him that. Do you know? Do you know that justification, what justification means? That, that Jesus lived the perfect life. His, his righteousness has been given to us, imputed, counted toward us, because we're not righteous, he is. And that by his atoning work on the cross, we have been forgiven of our sins. We've talked about this in Galatians. Justification, one coin, two sides, forgiven, righteous. Not our righteousness, Christ's righteousness, and forgiven, not by our works, but by Christ's work. That's what it means to be justified. Very important. A Puritan by the name of Thomas Watson said this, Justification is the very hinge and pillar of Christianity. An error about justification is dangerous. Like a defect in a foundation, justification by Christ is a spring of water, of the water of life. To have the poison of corrupt doctrine cast into this spring is damnable, end quote. Paul said in Galatians 1 is damnable. To be made right with God is through forgiveness of our sin, through the atonement, and through the perfect work of Jesus that now has been granted and, and been given to us, imputed to our account. It's very important. Okay? Second thing he says, if you notice here, the second pairs is the instruction about washings and the laying of hands. What's interesting about this verse, if you all like, like some, of, some of the Greek study or some of the word studies, I'm no Greek scholar, I just have tools to show me, is the word here, washing, is where we get the word baptism, baptizo, in the Greek, baptizo, but it's, it's a noun, baptisma. So whenever it's, a, it's not only it's a noun, it's plural. That's why we don't have the word baptism. Everywhere in the Bible when this word is mentioned and it's not and it's singular, it means baptism. But here it's plural. So that's why many of your translations use the word washings. I think the reason is, if you think of the context, is that the Jewish people were going back to the rituals of the Old Testament. And there were a lot of washings, ablutions in the Old Testament. The priests would wash their hands, their feet. The Gentiles, if you came into the faith, into the Judaism, into the Old Testament faith before Christ, you had to have your whole body washed because you were really dirty. Right? And these washings, these ablutions of the Old Testament were to teach us that sin corrupts. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that sin contaminates. But Christian baptism symbolizes not only unity with Christ, and identify, uh, identification with him in his life, death, and resurrection. And all these ablutions and washings of various ceremonial washings under the Old Testament are now nullified because of the perfect cleansing procured by the shedding of the blood of Jesus and symbolized by believer's baptism. Okay? And, 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 I, and I think that's, that's what he's trying to say. And then he says, look, the laying of hands. Not only washing, not only, don't go back to ritual, don't go back to these Old Testament rituals. Jesus is the fulfillment of all those things, and Christian baptism kind of symbolizes the cleansing of, 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 of the water of the Old Testament by his blood. And he talked about, it's hard to know what he means by laying on hands. In the Old Testament, people would lay their hands on like a, a sacrifice, and, and symbolic of, of putting your guilt upon that sacrifice or someone's devoted to service. They would even lay hands on criminals in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we see people laying on hands for healing, for commissioning, receiving the Holy Spirit in the beginning of Acts, receiving spiritual gifts. All, these all have to do with, with laying on hands. So we're not quite sure. But one thing I think we can say, with washings and laying of hands, what the, what the author wants us to see and wants you to see this morning is there some basic truths about the initiation into the kingdom. The beginning of the believer's commitment to Christ is by Christ alone. As Al Mohler said, whatever the case these guys are talking about with laying of hands, these Christians were getting caught up in matters regarding the laying on of hands and not the righteousness secured for them in Christ alone, end quote. That's the point. Learn the basics. Third thing he says, and the final thing of the, of the pairs of twos, is the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Now, family, you may have never heard this before, but let me tell you. In the Old Testament, there's not a whole lot of teaching about 
the resurrection of the dead. There's not a lot. A lot of it is in the New Testament. In fact, it's very serious in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 15 gives this whole chapter, a long chapter, on the resurrection from the dead. And we see the fulfillment of the resurrection of the dead in the New Testament through the person and work of Jesus Christ who said what? I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. John 11. So what you have in the Bible is what's called, and this is free, progressive revelation. In other words, God did not drop the Bible out of the sky and we said, oh, we got it in one day, in one moment. Right? That, that's not what happened. He, the Bible says, through men who spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit throughout history, recorded the things of God. Then we learn a little bit more and a little bit more and the full revelation of God's word from the Old Testament into the New Testament and we're told in greater detail about the resurrection of the dead fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And the same thing about the same thing when it comes to judgment, right? We, we see some of it in the old. We see some of it um, in the Old Testament, but we see a greater use of it, a greater understanding of it in what the New Testament. The New Testament. We're told a lot about eternal judgment. We're told that believers that there is no condemnation, there is no judgment for those who are in Christ Jesus. That we pass from judgment to life. That's what believers can be guaranteed because of Jesus. We also know uh, what's going to happen to unbelievers. We talk about the judgment of, of the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25. The great white throne judgment, Revelation 20. We know that to Jesus Christ has been committed all judgment, John 5. And foundational and fundamental to the Christian hope is the resurrection that awaits us after the grave, the hope of glory after the grave. Indeed, all the dead will be raised in the great day of judgment, those who are in Christ will receive, will receive with joy into eternal rest, while all who reject him are condemned forever in their sins. And family, this letter, this, this, this text is a warning for us, a warning and a call for all of us to make progress in our faith. The ultimate, or I should say the undeniable spiritual truism is where there is life, there is growth. Are we growing in the faith? Not, not growing in our salvation. We already say, well, are we growing in the faith? More than you did a year ago, two years ago. Are you growing in holiness? Are you growing in your commitment? If not, something's wrong. And you need to do a heart check. Meet with one of the pastors. We could talk to you about it. The text closes in verse 3. Just a short little sentence. And this we will do what? If God permits. If God permits. Our author will go on to give this mature teaching about Melchizedek. We're going to see that. But he wants his readers to know that we will grow in maturity if God is working. You have the teacher who is teaching the word of God, but ultimately you have the sovereignty of God and God working in the lives of his people. Again, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. We're not working in our salvation, working out our salvation. So let me, let me end by saying this. If you want to, now give me one more minute, it's very important. If you want to press on to maturity and be skilled in the word of righteousness, chapter 5, verse 13, you and I need, listen, a solid grasp of the doctrine of justification, imputed righteousness of Christ on our behalf. Chapter 5, again, verse 13. The righteousness, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 13. Paul writes in Romans 3, though, the righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. This doctrine must be learned, then rehearsed, and reviewed, and repeated, as Martin Luther says, beat, it in, beat into our heads. In order to have good heating habits, listen, we must understand that we are so radically sinful and that our own righteousness can never, ever save, redeem, or reconcile us to God. That our only hope is in the perfect life of Jesus, the gift of his righteousness on our account, and his blood that was shed for our forgiveness. Upon that truth, the whole structure of the Christian faith is established. If we do not keep rehearsing, renewing, and remembering the gospel, we become arrogant and proud when we are growing, we say, look, why can't you be like me? Look how much knowledge I have. 
But rehearsing the gospel will also fuel growth, a, a deeper understanding of the gospel. Because, listen, God did what? To love me? To redeem me? He, he, he did it all? If we rehearse the gospel, we're not going to be proud and arrogant because we came the same way everybody came. And if we rehearse the gospel, we'll say, God has done what? He loves me that much? I want to know this God better. I want to love this God better. I want to respond in faith to this God better. Who would see my situation dead in my sins, unable to reach up to him, and yet come to me and die in my place and rise from the dead and call me to himself? Who would do that? I want to know him better. I want to love him better. You see how important the doctrine of justification truly is as we grow in our faith. So I hope this word has been an encouragement to you. It's been an encouragement to me. One last thing. If you don't know where to begin, there's, there's five pastor elders on the, uh, uh, at the church. Contact one of us. We'll help you. We've got some good books, some good resources. We can give you Bible studies. We'll get you involved in a discipleship. We have those sheets we give out every day and, and, um, uh, that we give out in the bulletin. If you're looking for mentorship, if you're look, looking for more discipleship, fill out the form. Send us an email. We'll get you plugged in. We want to see you grow. There's a couple of books I love to give away when people have never read, like Knowing God by J.F. Packer. If you never read that, it's a great book. Cross of Christ, John Stott. There's plenty of things. Of course, the scripture, please don't hear me saying, oh, the pastor said we shouldn't read our Bible. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying you're not the smartest person in the universe. Amen? And neither am I. Let's pray. Father, thank you for not only revealing yourself to us in your word, but using teachers and pastors and, and shepherds and leaders throughout the centuries to help us to study and help us to know you even better. We know that your word is perfect, and we know that uh, it is enough for our salvation. And, but, Lord, we just pray that you would give us, each and every one of us, a hunger and desire to know you better to grow in faith, to grow in grace, to grow in knowledge of Jesus Christ. Not in order to be saved, but because of all that you have done. So, Lord, help us as we continue to worship you in spirit and truth. Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.